um, how did you, how did uh, getting your five um, observations go? Thumbs up. Maddie, what's the problem? I could only find a few, not all of them. Yeah, same as me. I found two. Well, well the objective was to do five observations. It doesn't have to be to find all the species, right? Uh, did we have a misunderstanding? Yeah or no? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I thought... I thought you needed like five different species, not That's five individuals. Oh, no, no, no. I have a lot of narrow leaf I can send you if you want. Well, okay, it's not about me, Kylan. It's about you. It's not what I want. Yeah, though, the, uh, all right. Well, that's, uh, that was just a, the objective was to do five different observations. So, yeah, I mean, for me to send you out and f assume that you could find all five of those um, would be kind of um, unreasonable. So, um, so that's what we're after. So, Hunter, Maddie, anybody else? Kylan, um, how about how many observations did you get done? I got five observations done, but I had two Norway spruce. Um, and the others were just uh, other invasive species in uh, like wetlands. Okay, that's fine. Yep. How about, okay, so some of you popped in since I asked the question. Thumbs up on the getting their five observations in there, IMAP invasives. What do you got? Jacqueline Page, Jack, John, Devin. Devin's nodding her head. Erica? I mean, technically I only did like one species, but that's what you wanted. So I didn't know that's what you wanted, so I thought that I didn't, but I did. Your audio is breaking up, Erica. It sounds like you're just, yeah, so five observations. Yeah, but it's just one species, right? They could be all one species, yeah. Okay. I'm fine. Okay. Anybody else? Paige? Jack? Matt? Paige, you got any Norway spruce over there in Sherburn? I think so. Yeah, you do. Everybody's got Norway spruce. We plant, Norway spruce is planted uh, very, very widely. Um, okay. How about, did any of you, I got, so I got that email from uh, Mitchell, Mitchell, I forget his last name, I think it's O'Neill, but Mitchell, and uh, followed up an email back to him the other day relaying the problems we were having. Can you go in now and see if you're able to, let me think about this. The problems were that only so far, Maddie, you're the only one who was able to, excuse me, you're the only one that was able to, uh, to request successfully to join CAS college as your affiliation or your, your primary organization. Can the rest of you go ahead and give that a try now? Uh, Cause remember a number of you were trying, as you were trying, you were getting error messages and, um, I was thinking maybe it was just a level of activity. I got a bunch of error messages when I did mine yesterday. Yesterday? Yeah. Like you go to organizations, correct? Yeah, that's, I did it. I, when I went to go do it, it was blank and then it said error. You need to update your lists or something like that. And now it's not doing it. Now, not now. Is it doing it? But it's just blank. Like on my phone, it's just blank. Observation comment. So, oh. oh, it's right there. Yeah. It's up a little bit, but it's blank. Right there. Yeah. Okay. I, was able to, I was able to send a request literally just now. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, Kylan, you want to, how did you do that? Because I think, did you go to your preferences? Oh, I did. Yeah, on the on the map. But last time I tried, it was giving me error messages. So it might just be a luck type of thing. Yeah, mine's still giving me error messages. This is the first time it hasn't given me an, haven't hasn't given me an error message. Oh, oh, okay. So Collins, I still don't see anything from my organization or anything. If you go into your preferences, I think that's where you have to. Isn't that where we? That's where I'm looking at. It's just blank. It's just yeah, blank. that's where I'm looking. My project is there. I think you have to do it on like a computer. Like you go on the map and then like just rewind. So you click on that and then you click on organizations. But it's still popping up with like an error message. Okay. Well, 
Okay. Well, I am at a Kyla, what how did you did you get it from your phone or from your laptop? It was from my laptop, but last last class I tried to do the exact same thing and it's still giving me error messages. Error messages. <laughs> I just got an error on my laptop too. Is that you, Jack? Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I don't know what to say other than you'll be able to add that stuff in at some point. Um, I emailed, I emailed to um, Mitchell letting him know that I was, so I'm listed as the administrator for, for the college and I was able to go in there and like, as with the project last week, um, I was able to see the pending requests from all of you and, and, and change it a member hit save. So now you're all, that's, so that's how you're all seeing the project. But, um, I can't even list CAS college as my own primary organization. I'm listed as the administrator of it. So I relayed that to him by email. I also let him know that everybody who's signed in on the, under this project, um, what we're ultimately after is to have CAS college as your primary organization. And, ha and I explained that, that I was getting nothing with the drop down. So, but that was, uh, that was first thing this morning. So, um, maybe, uh, maybe he'll get to it at some point here, but I'm hoping, I'm guessing if he's, you know, he's able to administer stuff in the background, he might just take care of all this stuff in one, one sitting. And then we will never have to worry about it again until you got to get in on another project if you ever do. So, okay. All right. Well, so we'll let that, I don't know what else to tell you right now. We'll just, Hold tight. Um, what we'll do eventually is you can go in. Okay, I can tell you this. Once you get in, once we get that straightened out, what you can do, what you'll be able to do is to go into your observations and edit them. Oh, here's another. So here's another thing I discovered. You apparently, I can't figure out a way to delete an observation. So I my test observation last week when some of you went outside and some of you tried and then came back in to get near signal, um, I had to stay at the desk here and. Um, took a picture of my coffee cup as my Norway spruce. <laughs> Obviously I want to get that gone because that's just a test. But I, uh, this morning I was able to just go in there. I just hit the little, the little pen or pencil edit thing. And I just replaced all the irrelevant information. Basically I just, I replaced everything except for species, made it an observation. Um, took a picture of the Norway spruce out in our front yard and click, get some of the ones in my neighbor's yard in the background. Cause Norway spruce are, like I said, they're, they're, like one of our most commonly planted tree species. So, so, um, so you that species option, like if that? This one, because I tried to delete mine because it's, I didn't go outside and there's like an option under the species for like a test picture. Oh, really? I think so. Oh, all right. Well, uh, that'll work too. Um, so did you hear what Jacqueline said? Her audio was, okay, that delete test, but okay. All right, so you could do that, um, or, 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 or do what I did and just take that test thing and just edit it. Um, okay, so I'm optimistic we're going to get this squared away, but that's out of my control, so I can't be sure we're going to get this squared away. I was hoping that, um, once we get that set up that I could, you get that stuff submitted to the project and then I can just use that as a way to, to look, to see that you got, you know, X number of observations. Um, okay. We don't have to get this done right away. We can just hold off on that. Um, cause that would just be a whole lot easier than having you all do a bunch of screenshots and upload them to an assignment. So as I'm talking that through, I think that's what we'll do. We'll hold off on that. All right. Okay, so now, <laughs> excuse me. Um, how many of you did get did five different observations? Those of you who are paying attention to me. Just kidding. Uh, all right, so Sierra, how long did that take you? Approximately, Sierra, Asia, Jacqueline, Hunter. I mean, how long is it taking to do those? Like um, five minutes. I, I walked through Forest Park in Camden, which is like two miles, and I just looked for things, and it took me about an hour. But that was walking around. Yeah. 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 yeah I had to try it for mine for so. <clears throat> I did yeah. it on my way home from work. I literally just drove the back roads. <laughs> you did drive bys. 
Yeah. That's what, yeah. I, that's, that's what I did on my way into work. Actually, you know, once you get to a spot, um, it takes you less than a minute. It takes you, well, I guess it depends. On, if you put any observations in there. Did you, <clears throat> I don't think... No, if I share screen, that would be the the desktop, and we're probably never gonna, you're rarely gonna use that. Um, let me show you on mine. Here's what. Um, let me pull up an example. Here's what. Uh, let's uh, let's potentially add to what you put in. And I say potentially because you know the spirit of this whole thing. The objective here is to document the species in a particular location, um, and it's got some some options for providing some more descriptive information other than beyond just, okay, it's here, okay, that's meaningful. But did you already notice, uh, here, let me find, let me pull up my Japanese knotweed example. Okay, so, I mean, this is, so just probably what, what you have or you will have, right? So I got a photo there, the stuff you've, you've seen, species detected. Um, was, G, was GPS working well for you? Like pinpointing the location? I was very impressed at how quick the software is interacting with the GPS as I was driving into work. Um, it was, um, before I even got out of the truck, the, thing was already caught up and, and which GPS <coughs> software would be able to do because that's working in real time but actually have an interacting with the um, the, the app a little different um, time searched um, that would be okay so for what it's worth we don't have to go back in and, and do that you know these are we're documenting um, for practice very common invasive species to be blunt we're not you know providing cutting-edge information here to the program but we're setting the groundwork that you may be able to do that in the future. And I anticipate we'll use this, like for example, in the fall and field botany, assuming we all come back to campus together and we actually go out together. <laughs> if that doesn't happen and we do this remotely, then we'll be doing it remotely. But anyway, <clears throat> um, the time search. So for example, Sierra, you said you spent, you know, maybe an hour cruising around the park. That would be relevant information to put there. Um, and it also has, you know, size of area containing invasive. I mean, you can, I don't know if you can read that or not, but it's down there in the, you know, the, the <laughs> excuse me, observation. So that's meaningful. Um, and uh, if, oops, if you get the drop down, it says up to 10 square feet. You know, 10 square feet is basically, it's like an individual or a tiny, a relatively tiny patch. Um, up to a half an acre, you know, half acre, that's like half a football field, something like that. Up to one acre, a full football field, and then more than one acre, you know, you've got a big patch of it. So that's, um, that's information that's helpful. And then the, the last one before the observation comments is the distribu distribution of invasive. And uh, your choices are trace, sparse, dense, monoculture, linear, linearly scattered. So um, those would be um, you should, you should, you can, yeah, go ahead and pick one of those because we're looking at plants. Um, for animals, it would be a little more difficult to determine those with any, with a lot of confidence. But um, for example, I, okay, so for my Japanese knotweed, almost always you find them in clumps. So I checked off dense plants slash clumps. Um, if, it's, if it's gonna catch your eye, it's probably many, hundreds of square feet. Um, so that's probably going to be appropriate there. Uh, the lowest level is trace a single plant or a clump like, oh, what do we do? Oh, if it was one like just one clump of stems of uh, Moloflor rose, for example, you can check it off there. I found, I know of a, um, you won't remember this till the fall, but there's an extra credit tree or a bonus point tree over at Lorenzo. It's called an amur. Uh, cork tree. It's the only, it was a plant as a specimen tree. So in other words, somebody bought it. They wanted to have that unique species. They planted it there and um, kind of looks like white ash, but there's some features that that make it just definitely not white ash. So that is one that it's uh, I hit the single plant or clump um, option there. 
for Norway spruce, a lot of times we see those, they were planted along somebody's um, property line. Property line, <clears throat> whether it's between you and the somebody and their neighbor on the same side of the road or the property line like near, near the road. And so the last one, last one there, last choice I should say, should say linearly uh, scattered. For example, e.g. along a road or a trail. So that's what I checked for the, the Norway spruce that I found. Um, oops. And then down there below, all the way down to the comments section, that's where you would add anything that would be potentially useful that is not covered in any of those drop downs already. Okay, so in some cases, you're gonna need anything um, for um, for my uh, one of my not weed observations. I like I was saying the other day, it doesn't really also doing is creating more entries. If you you see you know there's Norway spruce, you can lean on it, and then there's a Norway spruce ten feet away from it, right? That's two individuals, but we would only record that as one observation, one location. Okay, in the case of for example, at Japanese knotweed, we got some patches between my house and the college here, um, and in one place where I know the visibility either coming either side of the either direction of the road. Visibility is good, so it's a safe place to park, get out, get a couple of photos. Um, there's patches on both sides, so I took a picture of the largest patch on one side of the road. In the comments, I listed just described that there are patches on both the north and the south side of the road. Okay, and then for example, I'm gonna keep it this way. Here's one, and you're, you know, you all don't have the, you know, to be blunt, you don't have the experience yet. You aren't familiar with some of these species yet. Um, but for example, like if Kylan pursues his project with the rusty crayfish, he's going to have probably more information to add to these observation comments than simply presence or absence. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to try and hold this really still. You guys tell me, give me a thumbs up if you can, when you can read that. Am I not steady enough? Do much coffee. Damn it. You're good. <laughs> How about now? Okay. All right. Read it quick. You're good. You don't have to memorize it, but I mean, so that's just an example of um for that that cork tree. Because the photo oh, because the photo I took. Anybody's reviewing these data, they might look at that and they go, oh. What are the chances this guy knows what he's talking about? Because amber cork trees are easily mistaken for white ash. So there's the there's the photo I took to put it in context, right? If somebody would want to know exactly where this is, it happens to be really close to a an easy to easy to find point of reference with a sign there, right? So if you can put your your specimens um, uh, have something in the photo that just makes it crystal clear with the individual, uh, um, you know, the plant or whatever it is, um, it, it is how it's located, where it's located, and that's, that's gonna be much more useful. Okay. All right, um, so, all right, then if you, all right, so we, we got, we're not, we weren't all on the same wavelength, so, you know, Maddie and whoever else, uh, we're after five observations, right? Whichever of the species that you can find. Okay. All right. Okay. So now next, um, what I did, well, so what I've been doing, like all, all of us professors are probably doing right now is, uh, you know, coming up with the final, the game plan to, to finish things out and, you know, kind of figure out where we want to space things, how to pace things in order to, um, get done what we've got at the, at the high on the list, get ready for that last exam. And I went back and I looked because I haven't had to pay much attention to this because so many things are in, in life are just either just postponed or, or done remotely. So I haven't been paying much attention to the final exam schedule. But ours, ours is May 5th, Tuesday, oh, at the normal class meeting time, so 11 o'clock. All right, so that is uh, that is um, that's the Tuesday. Okay, we'll do the same same general approach here. We'll 
uh, join together here in a Zoom meeting. I'm going to have it ready on um, on Teams like we did the other last week, and uh, that seemed to go fine from my end. That seem all right with you guys, you all? Some of you, many of you, just plowed right through that really. Well, I don't want to. I'm not going to make a longer exam. It probably will. It will have more questions because um, we will have covered more different. Well more different species, but, um, but not, but I'm not, the fact that many of you were able to cruise through that pretty quickly. Um, I'm not going to respond to that by thinking, Oh man, I can put 80 questions on there because it's not necessary or helpful. Um, all right. So that's the way that's going to work. Okay. Now, so what we're going to have is, um, a couple of chapter worksheets and can you, can you go to teams? on your laptop and I'm curious, I wanna see, make sure I got this um, chapter worksheet for three, the invasion of continents, the ones where um, we got a, just a one one page worksheet set up there for, and, a, um, and I scanned the chapter using the ScanBot app on my phone. And I'm just going back and, and taking a look at it from my view. So if you go into Teams, go to a, our, our class, our team, and then the general channel and the assignments, same place you'd be going for other stuff. And uh, see if that if everything looks like it's the way we need it to be for you to move along with that. So we got a one-page Word document. It's the uh, worksheet. So it's just a uh, three, well, actually four. I lumped in brown trout and rainbow trout together because um, your answers to several of those questions are going to be very similar. Um, and what was I going to say? Yeah, as you look, as you, and open up, try that PDF for the chapter. As you scan bot. The only problem with the, uh, the scan bot is like the sideways on the... Oh, you can open that. It's fine. Well... Well, I mean, don't read it like this, right? You can just turn it. I mean, so if you open any PDF, you open it in um, uh, Adobe Reader, you can, uh, in the view, you can you can rotate it. Is the... Yeah, the PDF is working fine for me. Okay. Resolution looks all right. Like, everything's readable. Yep. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so, all right. So that with that worksheet, we in uh, investigating bio, this is, I've been using the same system, except I, wait a minute. Oh yeah. They have access. They have like, wait, Asia, you have electronic access to the, you're in fish, right? I had the book home with me. Okay. But I don't know if there's electronic access. Okay. Well, anyway, this one, um, because it's not a standard college text, uh, so as I scanned it using the scan bot on my, uh, on my phone. Um, so if you want to, um, you know, normally I collect these just handwritten, but uh, I, you know, you might not have an operating printer at home or um, because lots of us don't print a whole heck of a lot. So uh, if you want to type your answers in, that's okay. Okay, but uh, you know, of course, do your own work, um, and uh, and then just upload that. So we've had some have been able to. It depends on how you open that Word file. If you open it within Teams, if you do it in the browser, if you open your desktop app. Okay, so as long as you get uploaded the file that you have put your answers into, I'll be able to figure that out. Okay, if you want to print it off and write it, that's fine. Just take a picture of it, upload that. Okay, so that that should work fine. Okay, now, all right. Oh, I had a due date on that. Yeah, through the uh, by the end of the weekend. Okay, it will not. This is a short one. Um, the only reason I'm putting it out there is because we have flexibility and it's very quick for me to grade these things. So it's not gonna. Not putting that deadline out that far because it's going to take you very long because it is not. Um, okay, now next thing. 
next thing I want to do is I want to get some feedback from you. So we're going to going to have you do some groups of these, um, those, uh, uh, the species ID modules. Those seem to be going quite well for you. I mean, in terms of getting those done and uploading the <coughs> screenshot of you having completed it. Okay. Um, so let me share the screen. Um, are there any other off the, off the top of your head, are there any other invasive species that you would like to become familiar with? In other words, I'm asking that because I'd put those at the top of the list or, or types of invasive species. In other words, broad groups. More fish. More fish. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, well, um, let me, yeah, okay, we've got some other ones here. All right, let's see. Let me share the screen of that. And so one of the, the one pro, well, not problem, but one of the things that is missing from those species identification modules is that they really don't talk about the effects at all, at least so far that I haven't picked up on that. And um, it's about identification, which is an important piece. And um, I mean, obviously, but um, the effects of these species aren't all exactly the same. So let's, uh, let's go to the fish page and I will verbalize, you know, some of the, uh, what some of these species do. Okay. So this will be a good time for some notes because the stuff I'm going to relate to is off the top of my head. I'm not, not, I don't mean it's like the only thing that's a, that I can think of, but the effects of a lot of these species, um, if they're unique, they can be summarized really readily. Does that make sense? Like pretty straightforward explanation of those. All right. So let me go. Okay, here we go. The screen. All right. You seeing some fish? All right. <clears throat> okay. All righty. Okay. Let's see now. All right. Um, how many do we got? Okay. Well, those we don't have around here. It's on that bottom row. Let's see if I can get these all together. If I'd reduce, I guess I can't quite get them all. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. All right, let's see. So the ones that we have covered, so we've already done. Um, we've got, we did our carp, we did the round goby, northern snakehead, silver carp down there at the bottom. Can't quite see all of it. Um, did we, how much did we talk about sea lamprey in this class? This course, I should say. Very little, only when talking about uh, canals. Can canals, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, here we go. All right, let's go with, uh, well, okay, how about, uh, we didn't talk about, did we talk about LYs? I think we did, but that was probably really brief as well. Like the reason that we um, started introduced and playing around with the uh, Pacific salmon species in the Great Lakes. Does that sound familiar? From way back before the break? Yeah. I get this class and other classes of yours mixed up, so I don't know what class it was. <laughs> yeah, this would be a good question for John, because he didn't take a first year seminar. John, Alewives, you got anything there? John, John, John. John's logged in, but he's mentally checked out. All right. Um, okay. Let me, uh, I see my screen here. Pranaj is trying to get into our team's meeting. Okay. Um, Anybody have text contact with her? Got a 
need to pause just for one student, but she's in a tough situation. All right, see if I can do this at the same time. Um, okay, so alewives. Uh, these are, these remember the herring family. Alewives. Herring family. These are a species that is native to the uh, North Atlantic. Okay, so they're native to the U.S., but these got introduced into the Great Lakes system through the canals um, systems and the populations exploded. And they basically started to outcompete our other cray fish out there and got very abundant. And back, and this got to the point where back in the, back in, for example, the 50s and especially in the 60s, what happened is people started to, um, Uh, she gave up. Okay. People started to find that these things, they die off. They would die off in mass numbers and uh, wash up on shore. And, you know, fish don't smell great to begin with. And when they start to rot, they really don't smell good. So, um, like in first year seminar, I probably showed you all some, some, some photos, like no old newspaper articles, you know, people uh, just windrows, like and windrows are when wind, pushes some material up into literally rows. So sometimes it does it with vegetation. Like you can imagine like you cut your grass with a mower and it, and it blows the, the grass clippings. You can kind of think of what, what it's leaving behind as a windrow. If you waited too long and the grass kind of clumps and, and ends up in a ridge. Okay, same thing happens with stuff coming off the water. Um, you know, vegetation, whether it's native or invasive, sometimes gets pushed up on shore in a windrow, <coughs> okay, on the, the downwind side of the body of water. But anyway, these alewives, they die off in mass. They're very temperature sensitive and uh, they would die. And uh, they have, you know, you read descriptions of people that actually get bulldozers to try and move this stuff, collect it and get it out of there because the stench just kept people from, you know, be able to use their, their, their cottage, the camp and be able to use those areas. So one of the responses there was, okay, how do we try and control this prey fish? And that's what actually inspired, um, fisheries biologists to start experimenting with some of the Pacific salmon species and stock those. It wasn't, it wasn't, the primary objective there was not to start to develop, you know, um, a recreational or a commercial fishery. It was to try and control this invasive species. And then pretty quickly, I mean, if we're going int to introduce a predatory species or a number of species to control some prey, Obviously, if it's successful, um, what's going to go along with that is going to be the development of a fishery, and that's what we've got now. Um, and that, so that started to develop very quickly. So, so anyway, that's why we consider alewives to be invasive. Um, and also, actually, there's another reason alewives are problematic, not just because they displace prey species, but uh, for those of you who remember last semester, what else is unique about alewives as prey species for salmon that's that's a problem? Anybody? It's something about their flesh. Anybody? Jack? Aren't they like golden shiners where like the scales will fall off really easily? They do fall off pretty easily. So does that have anything to do with like uh, escaping predation? That does, yeah. So we've got some organisms that, um, that uh, yeah, they can lose their scales really easily if something grabs them. Okay. What do you got, anything? Jack, John, and Delaney, I can't see you. So alewives produce some, have a, a high concentration of thymonase. Does that ring a bell for some of you? Well, it should because we talked about this quite a bit last fall and uh, learned about it up at the hatchery for some of you. Okay, so thymonase is the enzyme, is an enzyme. When you see ACE, I guess you'll be able to see this. Ah, if I could spell thiaminase. Whenever you see ASE, Whenever you see ASC, that that um, uh, suffix dash ASC, it's a some kind of an enzyme, right? A biological catalyst, something that makes something happen. 
relatively quickly. And then thiaminase, thiaminase, that's an enzyme that breaks down thiamin, one of the amino acids. So, um, excuse me, fish that eat a lot of alewives is a big part of their diet. They don't, their reproductive success is very much affected. Okay. So remember we were up there, some of you were up at the hatchery. If you're over at the, uh, well, we weren't actually adding the thiamin there, but, uh, you know, we heard about that from some of the hatchery uh, folks up there. That that's what they do with the eggs they're collecting there um, to ca basically counteract the effects of the thymonase. Okay. So that's one of the big effects right there. So there's basically two of them. Um, displacing native prey species um, and then the production of that thymonase. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. How about goldfish? Yeah, we didn't talk about goldfish. So carp, all the carp are common carp. Um, yeah, the big head carp, we don't have those around here and, um, uh, common carp, grass carp, silver carp. I think I'm forgetting one of the other sort of important ones that have been transported and established somewhere in the, in North America, but carp and goldfish, these are all actually in the minnow family. Okay. When we, people say minnow, oftentimes they're talking about a small fish, but, you know, so any, all fish start out small, but, um, so when they are small, that's understandable. People might look at them and see them in the water. Oh, look at a bunch of minnows, but they could be a bunch of young muskies, right? But, um, but these are actually in the minnow family, right? So they share those, some of those evolution from an evolutionary standpoint, they are more closely related to things like black nose dace and, you know, fathead minnows and gold shiners, some of those other species that some of you are familiar with from other classes, but goldfish, um, relatively easy to breed them. So they get these bright colors. So that's what we've done. So we get those in the pet industry. And unfortunately, uh, people let those go. They can, they are prolific reproducers and can take over and displace other species, other um, fish species. So they're, and they're pretty, they're generalists, right? So they'll, they'll eat whatever they get their mouths around. Okay. And goldfish can get large, much larger than a lot of people think. Uh, they can get up to the size of basically small carp. Um, you know, you think about, uh, you've seen people have koi, K-O-I, right? Those are nothing more than fancy bread carp, common carp. Um, and um, goldfish can attain the sizes of some of the koi like you might see in a, you know, a fish tank um, or a little pond. Or sometimes you go to like a, like a, like an Asian restaurant, sometimes I'll have a, like an open air um, in the floor, an open air pool, right? Those are usually koi, um, but uh, goldfish can attain those sizes. So, but they uh, they can take over, and on a lot of people would think, okay, they're so brightly colored. Wouldn't other predatory fish? Wouldn't that make them very susceptible per, to predation? Excuse me. Well, I haven't really read any. I haven't seen any studies about how susceptible they are to predation, like. Does that bright color make them more susceptible? You would think so, but they reproduce very rapidly. So even if their coloration does make them more easy for to become lunch, um, their reproductive capacity overwhelms that. Okay, um, they hibernate. They uh, they um, during the so they're just starting to come out of hibernation. You know, right around now in waters where they are. Okay, um, so, you know, goldfish are a prime example of something where we just have, uh, well, I guess there's a one question, but an easy exam question could be, okay, so how do goldfish get out there? Because people get them as pets, and they decide they don't want to take care of them anymore and dump them somewhere, right? Okay, so, all right, there's a goldfish. Oh, and I mentioned they hibernate. They, these can withstand uh, cold, relatively cold climate. So that's part of the reason they become problematic. All right, let's see. What else did we not hit? Grass carp. We didn't hit grass carp at all in this class, did we? Grass carp? Okay. So uh, what's what's the problem with grass carp? Anybody? We talked about these last semester, number you. They eat a lot of the vegetation. Yeah, so they're they're herbivorous. They are that makes them a rarity. Most most vast, vast, vast majority of fish are carnivorous. Once they attain a size where their their mouth is big enough to start, you know, grabbing zooplankton, that's what they continue to do. But these actually feed on vegetation, so <laughs> they, in some cases, when people try to use them as a way of controlling aquatic vegetation, problem is several problems. 
they're very long lived. Okay, so if you put them in there, they could be there for a very long time. And so they're basically aquatic lawnmowers that are non-selective. They no no herbivore is completely non-selective, but grass carp will just keep eating. And so they're going to not only consume the invasives that you might be trying to control, but they're just going to keep eating and consuming um, the vegetation and area and just do more harm than good in most cases. Okay, and um, so they uh, yeah grass carp. Grass carp are uh, no good. All right, I'm just writing down the species that we're talking about here, so I don't forget. Okay, let's see. We already covered northern snakehead. Matt covered that back before the break. Round goby with the last round. That was um, Noah, I believe, right? Uh, we covered before the previous exam. How about, we haven't talked about rud, though, right? Did I mention rud at all? Okay, so um, let me... Well, okay, can, I don't know. What does rud look like to you? This will help you remember. Uh -oh. Why am I not making this bigger? Oh, there we go. Okay, okay. Well, since I have this in so close up, uh, with just this photo here, can you see a difference between grass carp and common carp? Actually, you can see two different things here. No barbels. Yeah, not, not the barbels. I don't think grass carp have barbels at all. But if they do, they're relatively inconspicuous. Very, they're small. I have to, you, you'll learn that. I'll have to refresh my memory. But um, and what else you see? There's a broad difference. This is pretty solid. Like it would generally hold true. What do you got there, Sierra? Gunderson. The colors are different. Yeah, the colors are different. Common carp, typically, you know, yellow, almost, you know, some orange or yellowish orange, right? Um, grass carp, uh, pretty much a greenish, well, more green, not nearly as colorful, I guess, as common carp. All right, now let me go down to, there we go. All right. Some of you see that rud there. What does that look similar to for some of you that are familiar with? We got there, uh, Matty. Looks like something I'd have in a fish tank. Couldn't hear you. It looks like something I'd put in a fish tank. Looks like something you would put in a fish. Okay, yeah, uh, they are. They're not unattractive, right? I mean, they're they're kind of they're a colorful looking fish. Um, this is this might be a like a spawning male photo. They aren't typically have really really bright orange fins, like, but not they don't have bright orange fins. Not all individuals, not all times of year. But does this look like anything else? Some of us we saw look like golden shiner ish. Um, golden shiners, and I'm trying to think where some of us saw those. We usually get golden shiners when we go sane, uh, like out of Stony Pond, but that's been a while ago for some of you and doesn't mean anything for others. But uh, golden shiner, golden shiner are deep bodied. So when I say deep bodied, we mean like this way. Okay, so you know, if you compare that rud to the, um, the um, fish right next to it, the roof, um, the, um, they're not. A lot of fish are relatively skinny. They're not as deep bodied. Golden shiners are deep bodied, not quite as deep as like a bluegill or pumpkin seed, but sort of, I don't know, somewhere in between there, like a black crappy ish. Okay. And um, also, so these are similar in size. Golden shiners can get pretty big for a minnow species. Um, they're used as bait when they're relatively small. Um, and that's how rud got introduced into our bodies of water. So rud, these are Europe, or, or, yeah. Rud are a Eurasian species. And these were brought over um, for the bait industry, for fishing, okay? And they're, they're tough, so they, you know, they stay on a hook relatively well. They're uh, relatively easy to care for, so they don't, and so those would be the kinds of fish that we use for bait, things that you can keep alive relatively easily um, uh, you know while you're trying to sell it and then somebody buys them I and mean, nobody wants to buy a 
a, a species of minnow for bait if um, if they're all going to be dead within an hour um, because they're so sensitive to temperature changes or oxygen levels or something. Those are the two big ones right there. So rudd are tough, and those were just uh, widely sold for bait. Problem there is uh, somebody gets done for the day and they, you know, they decide to dump the rest of their unused fish in the body of water, um, thinking, okay, well, they're going to just get consumed quickly anyway. But unfortunately, in that context, there's a, a obviously a, a good chance that uh, some of those aren't going to get consumed. They can start to reproduce, and boom, you've got a, a species where you don't want it. Okay, and um, so. You can see that deep bodied feature. And also, you see how the scales kind of, not kind of, they curve, the lines of scales curve downwards. That's another feature of uh, Golden Shiner that, um, that um, this shares in common with it. Okay. But Golden Shiner, you'll never see all that, that orange on them. So, Rudd have at least a hint, but like I said, not, all, not always that bright, but at least a hint of it. And Rudd can get bigger than Golden Shiner. I don't know. Did I ever show <laughs> well, the freezer and show um, in first year, for example, last year, Rudd uh, that we got out at Tuscarora Lake? Do any of you remember that? Yes. Really? <laughs> I don't think I've had that out in years. All right, well, anyway, so yeah, at Tuscarora uh, Reservoir. We, uh, that was, when I say we, I mean uh, classes that were out there about five, six years ago. And uh, we got this fish in the trap net. And I didn't know what the heck the thing was. I thought maybe we had like a state record golden shiner, but I didn't know really how big they actually could get. And so we brought the thing, uh, we kept it alive and um, with the intention of, um, you know, if, if, well, to identify it for sure. And then um, if it was a golden shiner, we put it back, but uh, brought it back here and um, keyed it out. And there's uh, there are actually some, some differences that make them pretty easy to tell apart once you know what they, what they are, but I didn't know that at the time. So, so, we, um, so I froze it and um, as an example, what these things look like. And we got two more that week. And um, this here's an example of where we, inadvertently um, ended up finding some information that was helpful to um, the lake association around that lake and we we had no suspicion we were going to catch any invasive species other than maybe carp but um, fortunately none of those out there but so that lake association really sunk their teeth into uh, getting out the word if anybody you know basically letting everybody who, who would potentially fish there let them know if you catch any of these keep them out right kill them um, don't put them right back in, but uh, we have not heard of anybody actually catching any, and I think we had nets out there another another week, you know, two trap nets for a full week, and never caught any more out there, so who knows, maybe we actually got the only three, that doesn't seem very likely in a lake of that size, um, but um, I've not... Uh, I've not heard of anybody catching any out there, and, and if somebody had out there, um, we know enough people who live around that lake probably would have let us know. But all right, so there's there's Rudd. Okay, sea lamprey. <coughs> we talked about those getting into the um, into the Great Lakes by way of the canal systems, right? So they are the obviously. I mean, those are easy to remember. And just looking at the mouth on those things, they're a jawless fish, right? Ancient fish. Almost all the other fish we're familiar with are jawed, right? So they have a jaw. These are jawless. Sort of that suction cup like mouth, this uh, rose, sort of concentric rings of these rasping teeth, and um, causing enough physical damage that the fish starts to, to leak, right? Um, bodily fluids. And sometimes we oftentimes see that used to describe bodily fluids, not just blood, but you know, you get a little scratch. Sometimes it's just some stuff you start to leak, right? It's just plasma. It's not really, which is a blood component, but we wouldn't say, oh, look, I'm bleeding. You're, you know what I mean? All right. And so, and that inhibits the um, fish's growth, its overall condition, reproduction, et cetera. And these favor uh, salmon and trout species. So those are really important, important invasives. All right. Silver carp, we, we um, already got. Um, tench. Okay. Tench, I've... Um, 
well, these are, the rest of these are out in the um, uh, upper Great Lakes, so not around us. I think I saw somewhere, somebody documented tench in a New York body of water. Does anybody sound familiar to anybody? Some of you pay attention to fisheries more than others. Um, okay. All right, so there's a few of those. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, I don't think I... Well, could do the rusty crayfish. All right, let me go back up to our species list. All right, let's, oh, let me go to a couple of aquatic plants that we should be familiar with, and, and many of you are already, um, because uh, because we talked about them back in the fall, and anybody who's thinking about area lakes is thinking about, has to be thinking about how we manage vegetation, and a big, chunk of that is how do we manage invasives. So you don't have to be an invasive species course to be in a situation where you need to understand about some of invasive plant species. Okay. Okay. Um, broadly speaking, vast majority of these, um, these aquatic invasive plant species, they all cause similar problems, almost all of them. So what would some of those problems be among or aquatic invasives. So this will basically be some review. What do you got there, Devin? They outcompete native species. Outcompete native plant species, and how do they do that? By like taking up space and just, oh, <laughs> the fish? Eating them? No, just keep going. Well, the f are we talking about the fish species or plant species? Well, you go whichever way you want to go. <laughs> well, I was talking about fish, how they like, for the alewife who said that they outcompete crayfish. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about aquatic invasive plant species? Like, am I still, am I sharing, you see an African oxygen weed and Brazilian elodea? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. So how about, how do we, so, and let's see, which ones have we already covered? We talked about Kylan covered European frog bit. Is that the only aquatic invasive plant species we covered? That one of you did? Maddie, Maddie did yeah. your Asian water milk oh, oil. Oh yeah, Maddie did milk foil. <laughs> Asian water milk foil. Sorry, Maddie. I was about to say that most of us would be familiar because of rig toss, but then I realized that was a different class. Yeah. Okay. So, that's where we are. Um, all right. So, Devin, back to you. Keep you in the hot seat here a second. Um, what? Let's think about what are the potential impacts of these plant species on other native plant native plants. Um. You said competition for space. Yeah. Well, when we say that, what are we really saying? Like, if you think about, is it literally there is no space left? No. So when we say they're competing for space, what is it about that close proximity as stems and photosynthetic tissue gets more and more dense? What is the problem with that? What are they competing for? Is it for water? Yeah. Well, <laughs> no. that's a smart aleck question, kind of. Um, they're they're aquatic, so they're all they've got water. They got plenty of water, right? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so what else do plants need? Sunlight. Yeah. So we get competition for light. If we're so densely packed, um, and we're shading, shading the competition because we're getting that full sunlight. Okay. So that's one of the ways these are inhibiting native vegetation. Okay. Any other mechanisms? So this is a basic fundamental question, and this I'm loving this because I'm going to write this up. This will be on the exam. Okay, you're paying attention. You getting that? You got that, Hunter? You awake? Okay. I just thought I saw eyes closed. Okay. So think of so you think about the basic mechanism by which aquatic plants 
outcompete other plants, okay? It's not for water. They got plenty of that. Terrestrial plants compete for water, but not aquatics. They got lots of it. Nutrients, a little bit. Um, but uh, most aquatic plants, like, there's not a bunch of, there's not wide variation in, in how much uh, nutrient availability they need. Most plants are pretty good at, at growing um, without really high nutrient availability. So that's not much of the equation here either. But so it's primarily sunlight. Okay, it's primarily light competition for these. All right. All right. Now, let's see. Okay. Devin, one more question for you, and then we'll let you off the hook momentarily. Um, do you remember? Oh, this is an easy one. Okay. Remember, so Kylan talked about European frog bit. Erica talked about water chestnut. Here we go. It's not a wonderful, I mean, it's a good photo. Erica, how many, how many petals does water chestnut have? I was thinking it was three. Is it four? Uh, yeah? Interesting. Okay, well, anyway, yeah, that looks like four there. But um, anyway, water chestnut floating at the surface. And then... <laughs> I can't hear, understand anything you're saying, Erica. Okay, that's all right. I, I get it. Um, so, Devin so, and others, everybody thinking about this. <laughs> okay. European frog bit, um, water chestnut. Those are growing right at the surface, right? These are floating plants, right? So these are like, they're the most selfish plants out there in the aquatic world because they're, they're right where that sunlight is hitting, okay? So they are outstanding at uh, out-competing um, other native vegetation for light. Um, many of the other ones are, sub are submerged, right? So the, so that the plant, most of the plant, if not all the plant, is actually in the water column, so it's submerged. It's not at the surface. And so Eurasian water milfoil that Maddie covered, that would be a good example there. Okay. But still, competing for light. Okay. And um, all right. Now, any other problems with invasive plants, aquatic plants, I meant, I should say? Other problems with aquatic invasive plants? Crowding out natives is one. What else we got there? No, any problems? Um, well, can't like the European frog bit, and since it's like there's so many stems, can't fish get caught up in there and die because of it? If we got really, really dense, and you had some really wimpy fish, I suspect every now and then one gets caught in there, but I mean, we look at fish, they're pretty good at moving around in vegetation, um, but could be dense enough to potentially inhibit, inhibit plants or fish's movement, perhaps, um, in terms of actually physically like capturing a fish and it can't, literally can't get out of there. I would be very surprised if that happens very often, but it could certainly inhibit fish's ability to, um, uh, to capture their prey, okay? If you're a big enough fish and the vegetation is very dense, um, that creates good opportunity for your prey to get away from you, right? You can't see it or you have a hard time getting it to it, okay? Um, uh, what else? Can't they damage um, the soil, like the nutrients in the soil, because sunlight can't reach, or like the water quality, because sunlight can't reach the bottom if they are dense? We can we can have differences in water we can have differences in water quality. Um, I would say not so much with soil nutrients, but uh, one of the positives about aquatic vegetation in general, whether it's regardless of the species, is it typically helps to keep the sediment from getting stirred up too much. Um, basically, by absorbing the physical by absorbing the energy of water being moved, whether it's in the current or if it's wind creating chop and waves and pushing water up against one shore and then that, that water's got to come back. Okay, vegetation helps to uh, mediate that and, and reduce the amount of, of water movement. It keeps sediment um, from getting stirred up as easily. Um, what about, okay, well, Noah, I was thinking you, because you, you, you do some boating, right? Yeah, they can get caught up in the prop too. 
Yeah, yeah, there's what I'm after. So one of the problems, big problems, like one of the most apparent problems, a lot of people with aquatic, excessive aquatic vegetation up close to the surface is, is getting caught in people's motors, fouling, whether well, it's a gas motor, electric motor, um, getting caught on the boat. Um, it actually, you know, ex excessively dense vegetation makes it, can make it difficult, if not impossible to fish. Okay, with, uh, for, you know, I mean, there are ways to fish in dense vegetation, but most people don't have the patience for it or don't want to bother with it. Um, so there's some recreational issues there. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. So let me give you a rundown on a few species here, like what makes them unique. All right. So Brazilian Elodea. Brazilian Elodea, this was, so here's what you, is what, probably one of those interesting things about this. This was widely distributed in the aquarium trade. So this is widely sold for people to take home and put in their, in their aquarium for good reasons. It's, an, it's a very attractive looking plant. It looks awesome and it grows quick, nice bright green. Um, so there's no wonder it's, you know, that people used to want to have this in their aquariums. The problem is, of course, they dump it out or think, oh, this would look nice out there in the koi pond, put it out there, or wouldn't this be beneficial out in my local stream and put it there, okay? Um, it looks somewhat similar to, excuse me, it looks somewhat similar to our native Elodea, but um, you'll see some of the differences there. It's, uh, it's bigger. And bigger in all ways. It uh, the leaves are longer away from the stem. They're wider, okay. And um, so that is um, that is uh, so that's the story behind that. It was widely distributed in the aquarium trade, okay. And that would be. Uh, and up until not too long ago, you could still get it, but um, unfortunately, I believe it is illegal. I think it's illegal in all states now. Um. Uh, let's see, how many do you want to do here? Fan wart. Fan wart, we do have this around us. It, it, it gets that name. Um, it gets that, I don't think this is another species. I'll have, to, I'll have to double check on that. But fan wart, in my head, I'm not sure if this is our invasive fan wart. In fact, they've, they've got the word Carolina on it, would seem to indicate, obviously, it's not at least native to the U.S., but Fan wart gets that name because the individual leaves look like a fan, right? And you can kind of see that in that photo there already, um, where you get that that leaf stem there, and then it starts to dissect, and then those those leaflets all end very uh, in a in a very noticeable pattern, you know, like a like a fan, like one of those fold out fans, right? And two two um, two leaves at each node, so they're opposite. And uh, really easy to recognize, and that's actually not a, a fantastic po photo of it. Okay, but uh, we've got that in in parts of New York. Curly, curly pondweed gets that name because the leaves look like skinny lasagna needles, needles, <coughs> skinny lasagna noodles. Okay. And um, it's easy to recognize. We've really got nothing else that looks like it. So you, it's you. You can't get it mixed up with other stuff. And uh, so it looks like, like I said, skinny lasagna noodles. Um, and they're fairly stiff. They're almost sort of plastic-ish feeling, like much stiffer, um, more, much more like a terrestrial plant than an aquatic plant. Most aquatic plants, their vegetation, or, or their parts are really wimpy because they don't have to, they're bathed in water. They don't have to stand upright on their own, surrounded by atmospheric air. They're in water. So how do you solve that problem? Produce some gas, keep it inside your cells, and boom, you pretty much got your how do I keep stood, you know, upright um, sob problem solved. Okay. Um, curly pondweed is, has this weird life, life history, life characteristic. <clears throat> it comes up early and then starts to die back um, um, as the growing season proceeds. So a lot of people aren't aware of how much of a problem it is because by the time the water's warm enough, they're going to go out there and start to you know, water ski and fish and, you know, use the water for recreation. Pond, curly pond weeds started to die back. Okay. All right. These are two we already covered. Okay. Flowering rush is, um, how many, huh. have you spent much time up on the St. Lawrence? Chances are good. You, you, you boated by these. Flowering rush is a, uh, is a really, 
gets, it can get really large, big clumps. All you're seeing, what you're seeing here, obviously some flowers, so you have no idea what the, the overall growth form is, but flowering rush is a, um, the flowers are actually pretty attractive looking, but it out competes, um, it's, a, it's a, an emergent vegetation, it's along the shoreline and um, can out, out compete things like, well, we don't get too worried about cattails, but that's kind of in the zone where you would find um, flowering rush. And the flowers are a dead giveaway. All the other true rushes, uh, their flowers are really nondescript. These are, these are bright and colorful. What does, that, what does that tell us about pollination for this, for this plant? It's attractive to pollinators. Yeah. yeah, so this is an animal pollinated. So insects attracted this, usually a combination of sight and scent. Okay, most of the actual uh, true rushes, um, those are wind pollinated. So wind pollinated plants, they don't produce bright colorful flowers. They produce, all they produce is pollen. So yellowish green. Okay, so flowering rush, uh, really easy to recognize out there. Once, when it is flowering, okay, Otherwise, you, you're going to see some of the growth form. It, it looks like just a really big clump of sedge or rush. Long, skinny, um, long, skinny, almost uh, needle-like um, uh, leaves. I don't mean as thin as a needle, but I just mean in proportion. Very long and uh, skinny relative to that length. Okay. Hydrilla. Hydrilla is a um, is one that fortunately we don't have. This is the one that there was a, a lot of effort went into trying to eradicate it and potentially successful because uh, at least last time I read anything or heard anything, um, they think they, nobody can find it anymore in Cuga Lake down there, Ithaca. And um, you're going to see when you look at that, it looks it looks comparable to Elodea, um, but the edges of the leaves are toothed. So like on the on the edge of the leaf, there's teeth. And then on the mid rib, um, it's sort of spiked. Okay, they're actually kind of a, actually a pretty interesting looking plant. But uh, Hydrilla, here's another one that was, um, was available in the aquarium trade and uh, got spread by that mechanism and then just spread so rapidly, especially in the Southern parts of the US that uh, it progressively has been transported, especially in one of these plants is pretty easy to get transported on, on a boat trailer, for example. And probably the occasional getting caught up on a, you know, a duck's, duck's feet, goose's, goose's, a goose's foot or feet, and, um, and make it around in that way. Right. Phragmites, we looked at, you know what, I'm gonna write that one down because, uh, um, the module will give you even, it's so easy to recognize, um, but the module will give you maybe a, a few things that I didn't mention the other day. Parrot feather, not going to talk about that. We don't have that in New York State or anywhere. Okay, these we do, these three. Um, Eric already covered water chestnut, so we won't be doing that. Or did we do that module? You did that module, didn't you? already but anyway that was covered in the previous the second exam but starry stonewort and purple loose stripe um starry stonewort this is actually a macro alga alga macro algae um macro meaning large enough to be seen with the naked eye lots of algae we can i mean we can see them but it's when you have so many of the microscopic cells together that we can see it um starry stonewort like Cara, um, that some of us that you know did great talk stuff in Cas Lake and elsewhere are familiar with, but we also saw a starry stonewort. I think we had that at the Bio Blitz, did we not? Did we? Who was in that area? No. But I think the first year, I think we saw a starry stonewort down there. Or maybe it was aquatic bio. But anyway, it's easy, it's among the ones you're going to be looking at. It's super easy to recognize. Nothing else looks like it except for Cara, but that's not gonna be on this list. But um, I guess that word starry stonewort, the starry part, cause it's got these reproductive structures that they do look like flowers, uh, but algae don't produce flowers. This is simply where the gametes are produced. And, um, but it makes it very easy to recognize. And a lot of the, the uh, a lot of the plant is 
not chlorotic. It's not, it, it doesn't produce chlorophyll. And so it looks like monofilament, monofilament fishing line. If you see that, it's definitely starry stonework. It, it has to have some photosynthetic capacity, so it, it will have green strands. Okay, those are more difficult to figure out, but typically when we find it, it's, there's enough of it there. If you look closely, you know, which is a little attention detail, you're gonna see whether it's stowed, there's some starry stonework or not there. And it's, that has become much more common around here. We got it at Kaz Lake, wasn't detected more than a few years ago, and it's spreading. Uh, Lake Moraine over in Hamilton, there's parts of that lake that it's, they say, it's nothing but starry stonework on the bottom. The problem with that, so here's, here's what's unique about starry stonework compared to these other ones. It becomes so dense right at the bottom in a very, like a constrained layer, so dense that it starts to not even allow other vegetation to get above it. So instead of out competing for light at the surface of the water, it's actually just grows in a super dense layer right at the bottom and literally gets such a tangled up mess. I mean, and just really dense that uh, veg other vegetation has a hard time growing, getting established and growing up through it. Okay, so that's right on the bottom. And um, purple loose stripe. Uh, I think we probably talked about that in terms of that is a species that we, I mean, it's not surprising it's here. It, it still is an invasive species, but we do have a good biocontrol for this. So this is one that is not nearly as common as it used to be because with lots of research and effort, the basically entomologist studying has found a uh, beetle that actually um, does a pretty good job of keeping this, keeping this knocked back. But that's a, it's a shoreline plant and you can see it's not surprising why it was planned widely um, for aesthetics. It was intentionally planned as a, a landscape uh, plant. But unfortunately, it doesn't have much redeeming value um, other than that. The seeds are so tiny, not much can eat them, um, as opposed to other, a, lot of, a lot of other wetland plants that produce seeds that waterfowl um, will use for food. Okay. All right, and okay, beautiful. These other ones, uh, we don't have, you don't have right around here, uh, water highest, water highest and you can find some people will, I think they can make it work around here if they bring it in. Like, I'm not gonna include that one on your list, but here's what some people do, like with a koi pond, they might have water hyacinth and you can see why that, you know, who wouldn't want that in their backyard with a koi pond, it's beautiful. But farther to our south, it's invasive. Um, I'm not aware of this having escaped and, and, and being able to get established this far north. Um, but if somebody wanted to keep that up here, like in their koi pond, you would have that in a pot and you would take that pot out, put it in the koi pond outside, let it grow during the growing season. Okay. And then, and then have a way of having it inside and have it over winter. Okay. So basically like if you've got an unheated garage or a basement that doesn't get heat, like pe sometimes people do that with their they're flowering bulbs. Keep them inside during the winter, put them outside as they start to flower, and then just move them back and forth. Okay, okay so there's some key aquatic invasive plant species. All right, any questions there? All right. Um, what do we got there in terms of species? Okay, that's uh, actually we just, we just, Briefly talked about three groups of four. Um, you wanna, what do you want me to assign you? I'm, I'm look, I just drew lines in my notes here. I got the four fish together and I got two groups of four plants. What do you want to tackle next? Matt Dayett, what do you want? Make Matt make a decision. Uh, I don't really know. Some of the plants probably because that's what I'm least familiar with. All right. I don't have any specific ideas though. Well, that works. What I did there is I just made you all feel like I gave you a choice. <laughs> and I did, but all right, so I'll, I'll, I'll do, uh, I'll put four of those together. I just want to space these out. You're, these are, I don't think you're going to find any of these really to be much of a challenge. Like, oh, this is so hard to recognize, but it's about practice and getting uh, comfortable with it. So we're at the 23rd. 
think what I'll do is I'll make, I'll have, uh, and these aren't taking you more than about 10 minutes, right? Still going quick. Um, so I guess in terms of preparing for next week, I'll, I'll just set four due for four due for next Tuesday, four for Thursday and, uh, four for the, maybe four for the following weekend. Just, just so to make sure you force you to, if you, if you're going to follow it, you know, try and get them done by deadline, force you to have them done, um, before, like by the end of that weekend before uh, finals, because they're going to have a brief worksheet for like, chapter four and four five out of the Elton book the last couple chapters in that book um we've typically not covered there it's not because they stink it's just they uh it's really basic ecological stuff that we cover in other classes so not high on the list okay any questions just about anything all right um so okay then um, hang out if anybody needs anything, I don't know, advising or class-wise or whatever.